Hey, thank you. You're very nice. I am. Thank you very much. Welcome to A Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. Well, we're back after 10 days off, and I never imagined that after 10 days, a global pandemic would not be the lead story. Remember when we were all afraid of our groceries? I miss those days. No, the story that has pushed 100,000 COVID deaths below the fold is America's pre-existing condition, racism. Protests against police targeting black people have broken out in dozens of cities. So April was global pandemic. May is massive nationwide protests over systemic racism. I assume June is a plague of locusts. Then in July, pleated pants are coming back. And it's not just U.S. citizens protesting racism in the United States. Protesters gathered in London, Toronto, even Berlin. You know it's bad when Germany thinks your country's racist. That's like Jamaica telling you to put down the bong. These protests were sparked last Monday by the extrajudicial execution of a man named George Floyd, face down in a street in Minneapolis. Floyd died after a police officer knelt on his neck for nearly nine minutes. Now, in civilized countries, that's called murder. The culprit is Minneapolis police officer and cop who's so dirty even his badge is crooked, Derek Chauvin. Adding to the outrage is that it took four days to arrest the officer, even though there's video of him doing it. It would be the shortest episode of Law & Order ever. In the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate but equally important groups, the police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders, who in this case are the police, because, come on, we all saw the video. What are you waiting for? That's it. I'm going to the protest. Do the dun-dun. <laughs> Even after Chauvin was arrested, he was charged with third-degree murder. That's a pretty light charge. That's like prosecuting Jeffrey Dahmer for a bad case of the munchies. We find the defendant hangry. Plus, the other three officers involved have not been charged with the crime. So if you're wondering why people are so upset, it's because this is so upsetting. Also, it's not an isolated incident. On the very same day that Floyd was killed, there was another viral video of a white woman named Amy Cooper who was confronted by a black bird watcher who asked her to put her dog on a leash in Central Park, and she responded by doing this. Can I take a picture of calling the cops? Please, please call the cops. Please call the cops. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. There is an African-American man. I am in Central Park. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. <laughs> and my dog. I'm sorry, I can't hear you either. I'm being threatened by a man in the ramble. Please send the cops immediately. She knows exactly what she's doing and why that man should be afraid of the police. A brilliant performance. She should win the White Lady Oscar, also known as the Oscar. Now, Floyd's death comes on the heels of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, and also has eerie similarities to Eric Garner in 2014. And in that same year, there was the case of Michael Brown and Ferguson, Tamir Rice in Cleveland. All of those echo Emmett Till and the Scottsboro Boys, which happened in the context of Jim Crow, which itself was a soft relaunch of slavery. So you've really got to go back to the triangle trade, which ultimately stems from man's inhumanity to man and our essential fallen nature. So maybe start with the Garden of Eden. Actually, you know what? In the beginning, there was a single point of all matter and energy under tremendous pressure. But you know, there's always a few bad atoms and the whole thing exploded. Now, in times like these, we need empathetic and moral leadership. Unfortunately, we have Donald Trump. Normally, during national unrest, presidents step up and address the nation's pain. Following the death of Michael Brown, President Obama met with activists in the White House. President Clinton comforted the nation with a moving address after the Oklahoma City bombing. Even Richard Nixon, in 1970, made a surprise trip where he spoke to students protesting the Vietnam War. Who can forget his stirring words? We've got to come together and defeat our common enemy. The Jews, I wrote down on this list. Trump can't even match the compassion of a Nixon. Because as the protest raged on, Trump's advisors discussed the prospect of an Oval Office address in an attempt to ease tensions, but the idea was quickly scrapped for lack of policy proposals and the president's own seeming disinterest in delivering a message of unity. 
Okay, Mr. President, we're thinking a short, powerful speech from the Resolute Desk where you call for racial healing. I'm sorry, what's that, sir? You want to act it out with a box of Aunt Jemima? You know what? Let's just let's scrap the whole thing. Today, Trump had a call with the nation's governors to discuss the ongoing protests, and he read straight from the authoritarian playbook. You have to dominate. If you don't dominate, you're wasting your time. They're going to run over you. You're going to look like a bunch of jerks. Wise and comforting words. It reminds me of what Mr. Rogers said about times of tragedy. Look for the dominators. Oh, won't you be... Oh, you will be my neighbor, you jerk. That was Mr. Rogers dominating someone. Then Trump said something really scary. You got to arrest people. You have to try people. You have to put them in jail for 10 years, and you'll never see this stuff again. So people are upset about systemic racism and a society that over-polices and imprisons black people, and Trump's solution is to do more of that? Well, you know what they say. Those who refuse to learn from history are Donald Trump. So Donald Trump is the big tough guy going to dominate the opposition. Pew, pew, pew. So naturally, on Friday, as protests raged nearby, Trump took shelter in the White House bunker. Well, if history has taught us anything, is that things always work out well for strong men who retreat to underground bunkers. Mr. President, come on. This is your moment. You're always calling to beat up protesters at your rallies. You could shut this whole thing down, just pop a couple of hydroxies and come out of the White House swinging a five iron with a Confederate flag taped to it. But instead, he tweeted, Great job last night at the White House by the U.S. Secret Service. They were not only totally professional, but very cool. I was inside, watched every move, and couldn't have felt more safe. Adding, nobody came close to breaching the fence. If they had, they would, dot, 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 have been greeted with the most vicious dogs and most ominous weapons I have ever seen. That's when people would have been really badly hurt, at least. Many Secret Service agents just waiting for action. We put the young ones on the front line, sir. They love it. I don't know why they're not letting him give that reassuring speech from the Oval Office. My fellow Americans, let me send a clear message to the people protesting police brutality. Law enforcement is just a bunch of cool guys who cannot wait for things to get crazy. They see you as target practice, and I would truly enjoy watching you get eaten by vicious dogs. Now let's all come together in peace. Come by guns, my lord. Come by guns. The protests at the White House were specifically in response to this tweet. These thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Just spoke to Governor Tim Walz and told him the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty, and we will assume control, but when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Thank you. Kind of an unnerving way to end a threat. It's like that scene in Taken. I will look for you. I will find you, and I will kill you. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone. Trump also had some more succinct thoughts, tweeting, So terrible. Where are the arrests and long-term jail sentences? We tried to, sir, but Susan Collins voted to acquit you. Now, while Trump isn't hiding, it's really good to see average citizens stepping up and filling in the void. Yesterday in Queens, Police knelt with protesters, while in Flint, Michigan, the sheriff joined the march. In Brooklyn, protesters protected a target from looters. In Kentucky, this group of white women formed a line to protect black protesters from police. In Louisville, protesters formed a human barrier to protect a cop who got separated from his unit. And in Minneapolis, a group of Mennonites showed up to support the protest. Mennonites! Mennonites think America's too racist, and they live in 1840. Now, I make a lot of jokes about Donald Trump because he is a dull and dark, corrupting force that is undermining America's moral leadership around the world and sowing hatred and fear among his own citizens. So that's fun. And during this COVID crisis, the president has totally abdicated his responsibility of leading the people to understand the need to do the right thing for themselves and each other. And yet, the large majority of Americans have done the right thing anyway. And my hope is that the American people will do the same thing now. Because ultimately they have to. 
For too long, those of us with opportunity and privilege have failed in our responsibility to look at the truth squarely and name the system of racial oppression that artificially divides Americans and benefits those already in positions of relative power. It's perfectly understandable not to want to do this. It's human. No one wants to lose privileges or position, especially when fear of that loss is magnified and stoked by political leaders for their own supposed advantage. And I say supposed advantage because if you deny the human rights and dignity of any people, you will ultimately destroy the society and civilization that you claim to protect. 58 years ago, John Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. Not only is addressing systemic racial and economic injustice the right thing to do, it is the safest, most conservative, most self-protecting, most self-serving thing to do. Contents under pressure will eventually explode. And that's not a threat. That's a law of nature. So it's time to ask ourselves, as it is always time to ask ourselves, what kind of nation do we want to live in? That answer requires moral leadership. So take it upon yourself to be a leader and set an example of the kind of country you want to live in. That might mean going down to a protest or making a donation or having a tense conversation about race. But you're not going to get that from the White House. So we need to step up and provide it ourselves. America is now officially BYOP. Be your own president. We've got a great show for you tonight. I'll be talking to Killer Mike. You may have seen his powerful speech he made in Atlanta on Friday. And also MSNBC's Chris Hayes. But when we come back, first we'll be talking with our friend John Baptiste. Stick around.